example, um, if I put, let's say, this square here, and I put this here, um, essentially, something weird's going to happen. Let's preview that on. Look at that. It's going to, for some reason, go up. And actually, even if we delete this here, if you let this go, it's going to literally fly away, albeit very slowly. Um, if we increase the force here, so we'll go through all this. If you want to, for some reason, just push geometry away, you can increase that, and that will go a little bit more quickly. Um, even more than that, we can take this. Oh, we don't have a sun. OK, that's fine. Um, but we will, for the most part, be dealing with geometry that isn't flying away. But we will be dealing with stuff that's moving. So this is kind of fun to use. So what we're going to do um, to get to that point, I'm just going to disable all this stuff. It's worth mentioning if you're using the reference file, uh, disable all of these things, or at least the timer. Uh, we'll get into what the timer does, but essentially if you don't disable this timer, um, Grasshopper is going to be updating its solution every 50 milliseconds. Uh, which means that your computer will probably run much more slowly. Okay, so what we're going to do is essentially we're going to make a parame parametric uh, funicular structure. So that's a structure defined by gravity. Um, the first thing we're going to do in Rhino is perhaps just draw a base. And you can draw whatever you want. So um, I'm using the uh, control point curve. So it's just the first curve here. And the reason why I'm doing this is that um, if we turn on our control points, so in this case, uh, F10, but I can't press that because the recording. So I can go to edit uh, control points, control points on. This allows us to adjust our shape afterwards. So our grasshopper definition will stay the same. But if we want to make like uh, some changes to this structure after the fact. We can do that. So that's why we're going to use those curves. So first thing we want to do is we want to reference this. Um, being a curve, we're going to go to parameters, geometry, uh, curve. We're going to put that down on the canvas here. And we will go to set one curve. And now you can see it turns red or green when selected. So we've referenced that geometry. Um, if we want, just for our future reference, we can right click um, this component here and rename it, let's say, uh, base outline. If you're working on grasshopper files for a while, and especially if you make ones that you think could be useful for a smaller part of your project, it's good to label things. Um, because essentially, let's say I came back to this one a month from now, it doesn't really matter if I don't know what's going on at first glance throughout all of here. If I see there's like three inputs, the base, the supports, and the sun in this case, then I know more or less it's going to like jog my memory. And at the very least, if I have no idea what's going on, I, at least I know what to put into it to make it do cool things. Um, so that's good. So essentially the way we can think about this is this right here is going to be the outline of, let's say, a piece of stretchy fabric. Um, or this will be the boundaries to chains. Um, so with that, we essentially need to make our sheet of fabric that we're going to apply forces to. So in this case, to do that, we're just going to make a surface with these curves. Um, so to do that, we're going to go to Surface, Freeform, and then Boundary Surfaces. Okay. 
plug that in. So now we have a surface here. Um, so we're going to be working with meshes now. Do you guys know the difference between meshes and surfaces? Okay. Uh, so the difference between meshes and surfaces, um, essentially, I'm going to make a surface like this. So you can think of it in the analogy I'd say is kind of like vectors, vector drawings and raster drawings in like let's say Illustrator being vector drawings, raster drawings being represented by Photoshop. So when you have a surface like we do here, so this is a NURB surface, um, I'm just going to deform it. Essentially what you have is you have anchor points um, and these define the way that the surface moves. And if you like remember in Illustrator when you have like the, you know, like vector curve, you have anchor points and it's going to define the curve. And no matter how much you zoom into or out of that curve, it's always going to remain smooth because it's defined not by pixels, but by those points. So essentially that's what a surface is. Uh, if you are working with a mesh, just like a raster image, it has like the 3D version of pixels. So in this case, they're uh, faces. So I'm going to convert this surface. Surface, uh, actually, let's go mesh from NURBS object. Um, so you can see what's happening here. Essentially, what we're doing is we're increasing the uh, definition when we go more polygon. So a polygon face essentially you can think of it as one pixel. So you can see if we go to fewer polygons, um, we click OK. Essentially what's going to happen here is that ah, screen so small. Essentially what's going to happen is we're going to get delete this surface. We're going to get a mesh that kind of looks like the same shape, but you can see how it's you know, for a lack of a better word, pixelated. It's faceted because these mesh faces need to be flat, uh, just like a pixel needs to be square in a raster image. So does that kind of make sense to you guys? So the reason why meshes are good um, is because you can apply certain, you know, tricks to them that you couldn't apply to surfaces, and we'll be doing that with Kangaroo. For one thing, you can subdivide them like this to smooth them out. Um, you can't do that with surfaces. So um, we are going to convert our surface we have here to a mesh. Uh, to do that, it's more or less the same command as we looked at here, so mesh from NURBS object. Um, if we go into our mesh tab right here, and then go to utilities, to mesh brep, so you can see create a mesh that approximates BREP geometry. Put that down there. Um, so, and then we can plug our surface into here. And you can see that on our screen here, we actually don't see much difference. Um, and that's, that's fine, but we want to take a closer look at this. And this is the first time we'll be utilizing Weaverbird. Um, so if you remember in the mesh we made out here, it had those mesh edges. If we go to Weaverbird, go to Extract, Weaverbird Mesh Edges, we can put the mesh right here. You can see what it's doing is it's telling us we do have a mesh. So let's say if I bake this mesh, we have a mesh, but it's really weird. So it's made out of these facets. They're like really gross triangles. It doesn't look very nice. Um, but this is the best approximation of that surface in a mesh. Uh, so in order to change that, we can go into our settings under mesh. And you'll see why we want to do this. So essentially, in the same way um, that Gaudi used these chains to define that geometry, we're going to be using our mesh edges to define our chains. So that's why if you think about what would happen if we hung these, 
they'd give us like a weird zigzag pattern across the structure where we want something more like this where it actually accurately <coughs> defines the structure. So this is why we're worried about having those zigzag mesh edges. Um, I guess just another thing to talk about with meshes. Um, so the edges, these edges surround something called a face. So meshes, the same way that 2D images have pixels, faces are essentially the pixels of meshes. So in this case, we have a face here that's surrounded by one, two, three mesh edges. Um, so just some terminology, uh, vertices, or a singular vertex are the little points they're the meeting points of the mesh edges which surround the face so that's what we're seeing there um, so with mesh uh, we can see we have a settings tab here a little drop in um, so what we can do is we can go back to our mesh tab go to utilities and then uh, settings custom we can take this setting component plug into the settings input in our mesh and you can see that when we plug this in already we're getting something that maybe looks a little bit more usable um, now we won't worry too much about all these um, settings if you're really excited about the nuances of mesh settings just refer to the user guide um, but the most important thing for us and for if you're working with meshes I'd say is this min count here so you can see minimum number of quads in the initial grid per face so essentially what this is saying is you're telling it I want at least 16 quads to make up this subdivision of this mesh you're saying 16 quads is the very minimum I need so if we let's say force this minimum to let's say 200 you can see all of a sudden now I'm starting to get something that looks a little bit more like my shape and you can imagine if these were strings that we were draping it'd give us a better uh, solution you can go super high like maybe 2000 now you can see it looks really clean um, you can always adjust this afterwards for your final model but I'm going to keep mine maybe around like 500 uh, which for our purposes will give us good enough uh, resolution especially when we're working with Weaver Bird afterwards um, so there we more or less have all our edges so I'm just gonna kinda like usual practice preview off some of these things just so we don't get our viewport all clogged up um, so why don't we start working with kangaroo so what we're going to do now we have our edges uh, let's go to kangaroo so if you click on your kangaroo tab here um, it'll look something like this. It has a lot of great tools in it. Um, there's also Kangaroo 2, which you can add on to this. So um, it's really fun to explore all these things. Um, you can see there's lots of forces in it, like rocket, soap film, uh, wind, shear, projected force, tons of really interesting things in here, gas volume. volume. Um, so just yeah take a look at these um, the main kind of engine behind all this that makes it work is if you go to the kangaroo tab here kangaroo physics this is sort of the main thing you'll use uh, I've never actually used this because um, I just you know installed the newer version today zombie kangaroo so that sounds kinda weird but go for that um, but we're going to be using kangaroo physics. So, so again, kangaroo, kangaroo physics. Um, when you put this in, uh, put it on your canvas, you're going to notice it has a few inputs, force objects, anchor points, settings, which we won't worry about too much at this point, uh, geometry, and simulation reset. So to set this up, you're going to need to put in two things first of all. So the first thing we're going to put in is we're going to go to parameters 
and we're going to talk about, or we're going to put in a boolean toggle. So that's parameters input boolean toggle. Um, and essentially what this gives us is a true or a false. Uh, so today we're going to talk a little bit about logical operators. Um, a logical operator is just something that follows logic. That means that it can either give a true or a false statement. Um, so essentially we're going to use the very most basic logical statement, true or false here, um, and we're going to plug into simulation reset. Essentially what this does is when toggle is true, so simulation reset is true, it means kangaroo's not applying forces to your object. Um, if it's false, if everything's hooked up properly, it's going to make your thing fly away or whatever. Um, so the other thing we need, and this is a super fun component, is in um, if you go to parameters, utilities, and then timer. Put that down there. <coughs> so timer is a special component. Um, essentially, it's just going to send out a true, 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 true at a set interval. So in this case, it's going to say true every I guess we can't even plug it in like that, but it is essentially going to update the solution every second. Um, essentially, it just pushes components forward, so it makes them resolve, in this case, every second. Um, does that kind of make sense to you guys? Why you just put it into the okay, yeah, so here's the other thing. It, it also connects differently. So rather than normal components which plug into inputs, the timer, its sole purpose is to make a component restart. So in this case, you don't plug in normally, you drag from it and plug into the side of a component like that. So essentially what this is doing is if this is turned to false, essentially what this timer is saying is saying kangaroo, resolve the problem. A second la later, it's going to say, like, kangaroo, resolve the problem. Kangaroo, resolve the problem. And the reason why it does that is when you're applying gravity to a mesh like this, let's say, um, if you apply a force to all the points that make up this object, the first time you solve them, they're going to be pushed up a little bit. Um, the second time, they're going to be pushed up a little bit more, but in relation to that first position. Um, so that's why it needs to keep on restarting the problem. So that's all the timer does. Um, we probably want a faster solution time. Uh, so if you right click the timer and go to interval, set it to 20 milliseconds, now it's going to restart that component any, every 20 milliseconds. So I think that's one fifth a second. So it's going to look quite smooth and natural. Um, in real life, gravity updates probably faster than that. Um, so that's good for us, though. Um, so we have our simulation reset. We have our timer. That's good. So the next thing we want to have is force objects. So force objects in this case can refer to anything that either defines the object we want to use. So in this case, these strings um, or the forces put upon them. So the first thing we need to do is to take these edges and convert them into, you know, in this analogy, convert them from lines in Rhino to strings in this model, or as a grasshopper calls them, springs. So if you go into kangaroo, go to forces, and then go springs from lines. Um, so essentially, you're going to take these edges that we got from our weaver bird, and we're going to plug into connection. Um, so that's good. Um, now, why don't we actually just see what happens? We're going to sort of build this up. We're going to sort of see what happens when we just plug these into force objects. 
Um, let's put the geometry in here. So apparently it doesn't like that just by itself. Oh yeah, it does. It's just because it was set to false. Um, so I did a few other things there. Um, sorry, it's always like a terrifying thing when in class you're like, oh shit, it didn't work, what happened? Um, so essentially we plugged our springs in there, our force objects. Um, the other tab we have here is geometry. So geometry is essentially the uh, geometry we want to manipulate based on these forces. So in this case, it's the mesh. So let's plug our mesh into geometry. We can preview off our springs. Make sure your simulation reset is true. And now when we hit false, it becomes this tiny little thing approaching an infinitely small area. If we reset that, it'll restart. So you see that cool little thing there. So that's obviously probably not what we want. Um, that's fine, but this is sort of the first way we're applying force. So the reason why it's going like that um, is simply if we look in our springs component here, it says rest length. So the length the spring will try to reach. In this case, the rest length is zero. So that's saying to um, Kangaroo, like all these springs, we want to pull them infinitely small till they reach zero. So the way to make something that's a little bit more realistic is to go to curve analysis length put that down so essentially what we're going to do is we're going to look at the length of all these lines of the edges so in this case we can see it's like 20.826752 we're going to plug our edges into the length component and then we get that same value 20.826752 and then we're going to plug this length into our rest length uh, input there. So essentially what we're doing is we're telling um, Grasshopper like keep these strings the same length. We don't want them to be you know stretched to a super small value. So in this case if we toggle false nothing happens because no other forces are applied to this. Um, our rest length is the same. You could do some weird things like if you right click uh, rest length go to expression x times 2 now you can see it balloons out um, it still gives us kind of a strange um, folding pattern here but all these strings are trying to re reach twice their original length but I'll just take that off and now it bounces back in to its original length and it's getting all crumpled. Um, so, the next thing we want to apply to this is we want to apply gravity to this. Um, so this is quite easy to do. Essentially what we want to do is we want to, I'm going to preview that off, um, we can go to kangaroo again, go to forces, and then uh, uni unary force. I think there's now a gravity in, in one of these tabs, but unary force works totally fine for us. I think by default, it's set to gravity. Um, so essentially, if we look at this component, so again, kangaroo forces unary force. Um, so a vector force acting on a point. So it's going to ask for a bunch of points. The points we want if you remember when you're we sort of talking about meshes we said we had mesh edges which surround the faces the intersections of those mesh, mesh edges are <coughs> vertices so the vertices are the points we want to apply forces to so in order to get those vertices 
we're going to go back to Weaver Bird. We're going to go to Extract. And then we're going to go to Weaver Bird's Vertices Component. So you can see, returns the point representation of a mesh. So G, the opener closed mesh. So we're going to put our mesh there. You can see we get all these points. Um, so we can plug that in our into our unary force uh, component. So the points we're going to plug into point. And you can actually see it gives you little arrows um, here showing you the force it's put on. If we look at the force, you can see that it's 0, 0, negative 9.8. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to have some fun with it. We're actually going to make a vector for us that we can sort of move around to see what happens. Um, but first of all, why don't we take this force? So essentially, when you have that unary force, hold shift. So you get that little green arrow with the plus icon. Add that into force objects as well. Um, I've found in the past that you usually want to flatten this force objects input so maybe do that just in case but you can see that now um, I'll preview actually I'll leave the force objects on you can see now that when we toggle to false gravity is applied to our sheets and it's going to fall down into infinity Now, what we're going to do, so we're sort of building this up, is, I don't know, for form finding purposes, this might be fun for like structural, creating a funicular structure purpose. This is totally stupid, but we'll still kind of play around with this. Let's see what happens if we do different vectors. So instead of just our, you know, negative 9.81, uh, value for gravity. Uh, why don't we go to um, does everyone remember gravity it's 9.81 meters per second squared. That's the acceleration of gravity. So that's why the force here is negative 9.8. It's because it represents gravity. Um, so in all of these things as well, so these aren't just you know like oh it's springs, like some programmer thought that would be a good way to describe geometry. These springs are called springs because Hooke's Law, which is like the first, you know, structural law ever made. Any object applied to a spring is going to compress or stretch that string, and that stretch or compression allows us to stand on floors and not fall through them. So all these things, I guess what I'm saying is that they are very much based in physics, so if you ever have a prop saying, I don't think that'd stand, well now you can say, well, yeah, unless you agree with Robert Hooke. Um, so that's why these are useful for both real uh, life situations too. Also, if you look at a lot of these pavilion projects, cantonary structure, cantonary structure, Cantonary structure. So for small projects like this, this is like a primo way to make your structure very structurally efficient. Unless you're going to do what we're just about going to do. So instead of normal gravity, uh, let's create a new force so we can sort of push and pull this around. So what we're going to do is we're just going to go to vector and we'll go to vector XYZ. Put that down. So you can see by default the vector is 0, 0, 0. What we're going to do is we're going to make some sliders for all three of these inputs. So we're going to go to parameters, input, number slider. Um, the number slider will double click on it um, and we'll set its minimum to be let's say negative 10 and its maximum to be 10. So 
so now we have a slider. Just if uh, to add a slider again, double click on the little handle there, not on the slider itself. But now you can see it goes from negative 10 to 10. And I am just going to copy that two times. So I just hit Control C, Control V there. And I'm going to plug into X, Y, and Z. And now, if we take this vector and plug into our force, you can see these arrows are actually going to move around when we play around with them. So now we have control over our force. Um, <laughs> and we can essentially be the wind blowing a plastic bag in the wind. So uh, let's look at what happens if, okay, now our structure is going this way, but nah, we want it to go the other way. But so now essentially we have created uh, the world's most boring flight simulator is something. Kite simulator. <laughs> um, so essentially now we have this thing that's controllable and flying around. Um, that's all good and well for our purposes though. For a cantonary structure, we actually probably want to put our Z component to negative 9.8, or sorry, 9.81. Um, and then the X and Y components to zero. So with a funicular structure, um, essentially what's going on is if gravity is going to make a, uh, a sheet drape down like this, if you flip that sheet, if you like, let's say, poured the resin on the sheet, flipped it upside down, it's going to be all in compression. So you can just flip gravity and it makes an efficient structure. Um, so now we have our sheet, everything set up, our forces, except we don't have any anchor points. So you can see in kangaroo, anchor points is another input, and that's essentially the points which we don't want to move. Um, so in this case, what we're going to do is we're just going to draw them in. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to, in Rhino, I'm just going to go to the polyline tool here. And I'm just going to draw around, like you can do whichever points you want, but I'm just going to draw around the points which I want to um, anchor to the ground. So in this case, I'm just going to the edges. And this is also, again, something you can adjust. So again, we're setting up a model here, which is very quick to iterate through different solutions once you have it set up. And that's one of the great things about parametric modeling is you set it up once, and then you have a pretty robust uh, algorithmic model to work with. Sometimes when I'm doing this, in front of all you guys and then there's like this step where it's like oh, okay this takes a little bit of time I truly kind of feel like Bob Ross it's just like kind of calm we're gonna make a happy uh, edge yeah so so what the logic is here is that um, I'm gonna make these polylines enclosed. So once I've drawn points around those, or a line around those happy little points, um, I'm just going to close this polyline. And essentially what we're going to do in Grasshopper is we're going to sort of use logic. Um, so a Boolean to say, hey, is that point in the uh, curve? If it is, then it's an anchor point. If it's not, then it's not an anchor point. Um, so what I'll do is actually I'll just we'll just take a ten minute break right now, um, but get your draw some lines around the points you want to be anchor points, and uh, in ten minutes we'll sort of go on to the next dot step and talk about booleans and how we can set these as anchor points.
so when working with logical operators, um, we also have some uh, if and or statements. So in this case, we have in Grasshopper gate and gate or <coughs> gate not gates or. We won't worry about that. And also uh, majority nor and nor. Uh, but for the most part, we're just going to work with and or or. Um, so in this case, let's go to gate and. If we have, let's say here, um, two numbers. So we'll go 1 equals 1. So we get here true. And I'm just going to copy this. And then we have another one, 1 equals 2. It's going to be false. If we plug in, uh, so with our AND component here, I'm going to plug that into the panel. If we plug our TRUE into A and our FALSE into B, we'll get a FALSE. So the reason why we get a FALSE there is because for the AND condition, it's saying is uh, 1 equal 1 TRUE AND is 1 equals 2 TRUE false, so we get a false. So you need to have both conditions satisfied. If we go to the math operators or tab, I'll just copy this panel here. So we're going to put in our equals which is true, our equals which is false, and we're going to get true. And the reason why we get that is that it's saying is 1 equals 1 true or is 1 equals 2 true. So it's either or. So in this way, and and or, it's, it's pretty, it, it follows English language quite well. Um, so it's kind of easy to use these things. Um, does everyone sort of understand the logic behind that? So we can use these in more interesting ways in Grasshopper. Uh, so, for example, what we're going to do is let's choose one of these curves. So one of the curves you drew, the first thing we're going to test is we're going to test if uh, the points are in this curve. Um, so in this case, we're going to go to um, Curve, Analysis, point in curve. So you can see now it says test a point for closed curve containment. So this is another kind of test. So before we said 1 equals 1, this test is test a point for uh, if it's in a curve essentially. Um, so the curve we're going to test right here is I just selected one. These curves select one of the closed curves you drew. Uh, go to parameters, geometry, curve. I'm going to set one curve. So you can see that here in curve it has two inputs. One is the points. Uh, the second one's the boundary region, so curves. So let's plug the curves into C. And the points we're going to test, we are going to grab our vertices. So from our mesh here, we have our weaver bird vertices. That's all those points there. We're going to plug them into the points for test. And now you can see we get actually something that's a little bit different. So it's essentially true or false, um, but it's giving us a little legend here. So if you see here, it says point region relationship. 0 equals outside, 1 equals coincident, 2 equals inside. Essentially what this means is if it has a value of 0, it's outside the curve. 1 coincident means it's on the curve, so the point is actually on the curve. And 2 equals inside. Um, that's inside the curve. That's what we want. Um, essentially, we can use these numbers here with a logical test. So in this case, uh, if we wanted all the points that were inside the curve or coincident, so touching it, we could say, does that point equal 1 or greater than 1? Um, 
so does that sort of make sense to you guys how we test that so in this we can say one or greater so if we go to math operators and then we can say larger than we can put that down so our results here will plug into a so is the result of this in curve test larger than we're gonna say one because we know if it's zero um, it is going to be outside the curve so we have two uh, options here we have larger than and we have larger than greater to if we go to larger than or greater to here so that's what that little symbol means larger than or greater to then that's gonna both include the coincident points because one equals <coughs> coincident but if we go to strictly larger than one then the only points that are going to be larger than one are inside so it's up to you which you want to choose I'll go greater than or equal to and so now you can see we get a pattern like we did before false 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 you can see the last one's true um, so with this then we're gonna plug it again into one of these call patterns so set sequence call pattern call patterns probably the most useful calling of all these um, so we'll go to call pattern the pattern is the larger than or equal that we get here plug that in and then the list is our original set of vertices here so we can plug that into our list now you can see if we select this it actually selects all of the points that are inside this curve um, so they're the green ones there so I'll just turn off these forces oh. what's in the larger in the larger oh yeah yeah okay so yeah so sorry um, all I did for that you can use a slider I just right clicked on the B one to set number and set one oh. yeah um, one thing that may happen with certain components I've noticed if you ever get this it's actually maybe better practice to go to parameters primitive and then number like this you can just label it so labeling the number does not actually put in a number it just labels it and then go to set number put one plug that in like that so it's the same thing but the reason why you might want to do this instead is one when you're looking at your file you can see instantly what's going in there so it's just nice for reference and two sometimes I found with grasshopper if you just I'll just disconnect this if you just enter the number or whatever value by just right clicking set number enter your number whatever sometimes when you save the file close it and reopen it those values that are just embedded within the components just have a habit of disappearing so if all of a sudden you're like um, definition worked before but now it doesn't work when you reopen it that might be why in a way to avoid that is just plugging a number parameter right into a component so now we have our uh, called points um, why don't we try putting them into our anchor points in our kangaroo component like so and now when we set this to false you can see we have our points they are going up this isn't very nice looking because um, we're just sort of anchoring it down on one side uh, so essentially what we want to do is I've drawn here uh, four anchor points so we want to make sure that we include all four of these regions so we'll go back to this and change that um, now the way we do that is we're going to use a different component so we right here we used um, point in curve we're going to use a different component called point in curves so just plural um, but there's a few things we're gonna have to do to sort of use it so in this case let's go to curve analysis point in curves plural 
so I'm just going to delete this pointing curve. Um, maybe I'll delete all this stuff too, um, just so we can review this. Um, so point and curve, so test a point for multiple closed curve containment. Uh, our points are going to be the same. They're going to be our vertices from our Weaver bird vertices component. And our curves, um, what we can do is we can either reuse that component there or again go to parameters, <laughs> geometry, curve. We can select all of our curves we've sort of set up as our anchor curves so the ones that contain our anchor points. We can right click on our uh, curve input and go to set multiple curves. And now we can plug these multiple curves into our boundary regions, like so. And of course if you're wanting to save this file you might want to rename your curve to let's say uh, anchor curves. Um, so, uh, now that we have this, essentially let's look at what kind of data we have. We right now have, it looks like, 454 um, uh, curves. We want to see what this pattern looks like. Um, I'm actually not sure if this is what we want or not. It's something we can visually check. Um, so let's go to our R here. It gives us that relationship. Again, we can go to math. We can go to operators. We can go to larger than. The larger than, again, if we look at this uh, legend, quinstant is 1, 2 is inside, so we'll go larger than 1. So I'm going to go to parameters, primitive, number. Set my number as 1, so set number one. I'll plug that into B. Test if these results are larger than one. And then again the uh, component we use to sort of keep the points we want, get rid of the ones we don't want, is going to set sequence call pattern. Put that down. Our pattern comes from the larger than or equal to or the larger than, it's up to you. And our list that we want to call, so our L input here, list to call, comes from the vertices. So let's see if this is good. So yeah, that works great for us. So does anyone have any questions about that kind of logical selecting of our anchor points? All right. Perfect. So now if we put these anchor points in um, and go to toggle this to be false, we get something that looks pretty lame. Um, now the reason why it looks pretty lame is that we, if we remember here, our spring's less, uh, rest length. Um, it's set to the length of the spring itself, so the initial length. So essentially this is really taut. It doesn't have very much room to move. So it's imagine if you had a taut sheet and tried like poking it up at different points, it's not going to move very much um, unless it's a really stretchy material. So spring stiffness here essentially is going to account for our stiffness of the spring like it says. So instead of leaving as the default 1000, Let's put a slider in here. So input, number slider. And the slider, we're going to double click on its handle here and set its minimum, we'll say minimum springiness 1. Uh, we can set to 0. It'll make Grasshopper mess up, but it's kind of funny when, what it looks like. Uh, and then the max will set to 1,000, so like it is right now. Um, so let's leave it at 1000. I'm going to plug it into stiffness. So 1000 looks like that. Now you can see as I lower it, it's getting more stretchy. It's 
so depending on the scale of your structure, like if this is, you know, six feet right here, that actually might be a pretty interesting space. If not, if we set it to zero, I don't actually know if it'll stop. No. Um, so, that is more or less how to make a cantonary structure with kangaroo. If you do want to stop this, like let's say for some reason you want to um, set your st uh, stiffness to zero and just sort of eyeball it and say like, oh, that looks good right there. What you can do is you can go to your timer down here and I suggest that you do this anyways before you go on to the next steps because again it's going to save uh, a lot of computational power. You're going to right click this timer and then click enabled and you can see when that's disabled all of a sudden it stops because you're telling uh, the kangaroo engine to stop working essentially. So that is our you know beautiful homage to Sagrada Familia. Um, this also, like I said, we can do different forces, but that's sort of the basis with what we're going to work there. So, we have these points, and now we can do more things with this. So, if we look back into, let's say, our weaver bird edges, so you can see that the kangaroo, it's giving us a bunch of things. So, output is just its runtime messages these for the most part you don't have to be worried about I guess in this case it's 10 iterations it's going to tell you how many times it iterated so this is really interesting um, to reach this point with the timer kangaroo recalculated 27,800 times so another good reason to use grasshopper you never want to refine your design 27,800 times uh, particles out, these are all the vertices there. Geometry out, that's going to be the mesh. Uh, Ke, total kinetic energy, I guess that's actually pretty interesting, so that'd be a value in newtons, um, I'm assuming, uh, that it would take to deform those springs. Um, so anyways, our geometry out, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to go to Weaver Bird, and we're going to go to Extract, and let's go to mesh edges. So plug that geometry out into mesh edges. And essentially what this is going to do is it's just going to give us a wireframe of how our edges were uh, stretched out just to sort of give us a look at what we did. Um, but now we can start doing some kind of more interesting things to it. So the first thing we'll do, I'm just going to delete that, that was just to take a look at it, is we'll maybe um, just go to parameters, um, geometry, mesh, and we'll take our geometry out and put it into mesh. And I'm just doing that just so we can sort of say like, maybe I want to group this. <coughs> okay, that's the first part of our geometry. Um, this is kind of the first step in our algorithm, so we can leave that behind now. So we have this mesh now. Um, we're going to look at some of the other things WeaverBird can do. So in this case, we're going to go to WeaverBird, Transform, and then we can actually look at a few different things because they're kind of interesting. Um, we can go to WeaverBird's Stellate Cumulation. Let's plug this in and see what it does. It let's set our distance to, so our distance is 5 right now let's set our number to 50 yeah let's set our number to negative 50 actually so in anything that requires a direction okay cool that gives us a spiky thing um, so a lot of times in Grasshopper um, it's fun just to try things out so I've never actually used this stellate command, but it does give us a pretty interesting, um, weird looking fuzzy thing. Um, one thing you can do in Grasshopper or with Weaverbird is remember how I was telling you meshes are defined by like 
flat polygon faces. One reason why it's really good to work with meshes is you can subdivide them. So I'll show you what subdivision is. Um, subdivision, if we go to Weaverbird, subdivision, go to Catmall Clark. Um, if we plug our Weaverbird geometry in there after we use the Stellate command, we can preview this off. Essentially, it's going to start to smooth it out. Um, so if we look at our mesh edges from this Catmull Clark, so let's go to Extract Mesh Edges. You can see that what it's doing is it's adding new faces for each face, and that's starting to create interesting subdivisions. So our second value on uh, Catmull Clark is number of subdividing iterations for each face. Uh, defaults 1 if we set the integer to 3. All of a sudden you can see it starts to have a lot more uh, subdivisions, but as a result we start to get, I'm gonna bake our Catmull Clark here, we start to get a really kind of cool looking organic thing. Um, so view <coughs> rendered. So pretty neat. Um, so we can start doing weird facades like that. Um, so one thing maybe let's do, so I, I kind of like this more than the openings I did before, so I'm going to use this to kind of modify this pattern. So we can also use logic to modify this pattern as well. Uh, does anyone have any questions about how we got here? The mesh component, uh, if you go to Weaverbird um, and go to Transform, uh, I, yeah. Oh, um, the mesh component's just from the geometry out. Yeah. So all these Transform components, they do different things. Um, so bevel edges, bevel vertices, the one I used in the example I sort of showed you this morning that I quickly threw together was the picture frame. So picture frame, let's see what that does. Picture frame is going to give us little openings like that, um, which also look kind of cool and we can control. Maybe we'll use that one after. But actually, let's go back now and go to this stellate. So you can see it as a distance component. 50 here looks pretty large. Um, let's say we wanted to base the distance on a point attractor. So a point attractor sort of being what we used in the image sampler, um, but rather than the value based on the image, we can use it on the value based on, um, on these guys' distance from a point. So in this case, uh, if we set, like, let's say, a point right there. So in Rhino, I just want point, set it right there. I'll go to Shaded. I'm going to reference this point, so I just selected this point. And I'll go to Parameters, Geometry, Point, Set One Point. Now you can see that point's referenced. So what we can do is since these meshes, they're uh, extruding each face, we know that the distance relates to each of these faces. So you can see if we highlight over the mesh, it's saying mesh V equals 454, F equals 494. So vertices is what V stands for. So 454 vertices faces 494. Um, so essentially what we're going to do is we're going to find 494 distances from this point. So let's go to um, mesh right here. Analysis will go to deconstruct mesh. So we're going to plug our mesh into this. So now you can see it's giving us the vertices, our faces. This is of our original mesh, not the weird stellated one, so maybe I'll preview that on. So this, um, the faces here, essentially faces work in a little bit different way. You can see that we get this cue 
uh, and then it says 141013. These aren't actual points, they're actually coordinates within the list of vertices. So essentially what that's saying is, I'm just going to grab a panel and plug into the vertices. You can see here that the vertices, like any other kind of list in Grasshopper, they're numbered. They have their uh, paths and their index numbers here. What this is saying in terms of faces is it's saying that, so quad, Q stands for quad. If you see a T, it means triangle. Quad face, so a rectangular mesh face, is made up of vertices 14 from this list, 1 from this list, so that's that one there, 0 from this list, that's that one there, and 13 from this list, which is somewhere down there. Um, so in order to do that, essentially what we can do to find the distance um, is we can just say, OK, each mesh will take the first vertice from that mesh, or from that face. Um, I probably... Did that make sense to you guys? No. OK, I didn't think so. OK, so in each of these vertices here, so, so yeah, let's go to this. So uh, if we go to mesh, or we go to weaver bird, extract mesh edges, So we have our mesh here, and we have our edges, the faces, and the vertices. Um, so we're, we're all together on that one. Um, essentially, the vertices are defined by random values. So not random, but they're, they're all in one list. So in this case, if we go to list, list item, I plug the vertices into this list. Since faces share vertices, the vertices in the list will not be repeated for each phase. So if we add, you can see here that's vertices 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So as far as we're concerned, they're more or less in an order that doesn't totally make sense to us. It makes sense to the computer, but for us, we might as well consider the ordering of these vertices random. The way that Grasshopper knows how to build these flat faces from these vertices is by giving a list of coordinates. So in the case of our vertices, we know that we have this list here. So here's our list of vertices. Um, each vertice is numbered 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. That related to some vertices in here. The way that Grasshopper figures out the faces is not by giving it the coordinates of those vertices. So you don't say this face here is defined by points with coordinates, let's say 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 4, 1, 2, 8, 1, 2, 12, or whatever. Instead, these faces are defined by the vertices, so the vertices position in the list. So for example, face 0 wherever it is, let's say this is face 0 here. Face 0 is defined by vertice 14, so this is 14 in the list of vertices, 1, this is list or vertice 1 in the list of vertices, 0, this is vertice 0 in the list of vertices, and 13, this is uh, vertice 13 in the list of vertices. Those values so let's say you want to take that further and you say, okay, so this face here is defined by um, vertices 14, 1, 0. Let's say you're like, oh, I want to figure out the locations of the uh, second and third vertice. You wouldn't be able to tell much from just knowing this. But if you have these two lists um, in combination, then you're able to use these as lookup numbers. So you say, OK, the second vertice on this face, it's 1. If we want to find out its location, then we go to this list. 1 has this location. So that makes more sense? Cool. So all that, that's the way um, these work. So essentially what we're going to do is we know for um, this command here, which essentially makes spikes on each face, 
what we're saying is we're saying, okay, we want to base the distance that we're extruding those spikes based on each of these faces distance from this point here. Um, we need a reference point for each face. So what we can do is we can use this list here and say, okay, we're going to take the first vertice from each face. We know where the location of that vertice is because of the way these two lists interact. And then we can find the distance between that first vertice and this point here. So I'll go through it and I'll kind of explain on the way as well. So in this case, uh, we have our one point, our reference point there. We have our faces, which have the different list of points. What we're going to do is we're going to deconstruct these faces into their vertices. So we can go to Mesh, Analysis, uh, Deconstruct Face. So the faces, so Mesh Face, we'll plug in the faces here. And essentially all this does is it just breaks up that list for us. So we can see the first one here is uh, 14. First one here is 14. Second one here is 15. So 15. And then we can see the second one there is 15 as well. Then 16, 17, 18. So it follows that kind of route. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're just going to use list item. So set list list item we're going to use these vertices index so remember these are it's just a list of essentially these numbers down the left we're going to plug a so the first um, vertice in each face into our index our list is going to be the vertices and essentially all that's doing is it's just telling us the first vertice of each face so each of these vertices corresponds to each face. So you can see we have 494 faces. Now we have 494. You can think of it as bottom left vertice. So that's, that's what we're doing there. Um, we could also go to Mesh Analysis Face Normals and then plug in our mesh to face normals and it would give us the center point of all those faces and that's what we actually will do but I thought it was best to struggle through the intricacies of meshes it's a good learning experiment so uh, but we can just use the mesh center points for all the faces um, so all our faces now all we can do is we can take this center point we can go to vector, point, distance. So center point of all faces, point there. This gives us a bunch of distances. Um, now if we plug in, let's say, our distances into Stellate, it's going to give us something really weird. Maybe that's what you're going for. Um, we essentially, do you guys remember that component remap? Remap values, we can use that. So essentially instead of these distances, what we can do is we can go to math, domain, bounds. And essentially what this gives us is it gives us the domain of the distances. So we know that the midpoints of those faces uh, range from 204 units away to 846 units away. So we can go to domain um, and then remap numbers. So values to remap our distance, source domain, and I'll sort of explain this after I hook it up. Source domain is our bounds here. Our target domain is by default at 0 to 1. Let's set it to 0 to, we'll go negative 1 to negative 50. And now if we put in this remap into Stellate, you can see that, actually let's make this a little bit more dramatic. Set domain to 200. You can see that 
the further away these things get from this point, the bigger they get. Um, so now we're sort of changing this so we can sort of affect these spikes. Um, so like that. Now what I did here with the remap values, essentially remap, if you remember, what it does is it takes a list of numbers, like let's say you have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and you want to, its domain there is 0 to 5. You want to remap it to 0 to 20. Essentially that would take the 0, it'd make it 0, it'd take the uh, 1, it would multiply it by 4, so it'd be 4. Um, and so forth. So essentially, it's just saying if you have 0 to, let's say, 10, and you want to remap to 0 to 100, um, essentially a 5 and 0 to 10, it's about halfway through that list. It's exactly halfway through this list. So in this bounds, it would actually be uh, 50. 2 on here would be 20, 3 on here would be 30. So that's what remapping does. It takes values, it takes the source domain, so in that case it's the bounds of the distance here. Plug in. The target domain is negative 1 to 2, negative 200. Those numbers are set just by kind of playing around with this one and seeing what different values worked for us. So we could change that domain if we wanted to. Um, but that is why we remapped it. We went into the stellate to do the weird spiky sea anemone thing. And then to cap it all off, we'll go to subdivision again. So that's Weaver Bird, subdivision, Catmull Clark. We'll plug that into Catmull Clark. Our levels of subdivision are three. And now we get a varied but less intense uh, spiky thing.